Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Today is a March 2nd edition of the MSP Initiative Live. And lo and behold, we're in the last month of Q1 of 2023. You're like, you, you just, you thought New Year's and Christmas, you know, is going to slow roll in. You know, and then there was like Super Bowl and the playoffs and NFL, right? We all know it's a little bit near and dear to my heart. And then like you turn around and like you're in March already. And like the, the quarter of the year is like, already upon us so just goes to show you how fast time's flying by but uh yeah let me go through some quick housekeeping and then we'll get into the good stuff so <clears throat> for anyone that hasn't been following you can find everything about us at mspinitiative.com under sessions you'll find this and every other session we've ever done going back to 2020 uh in podcast and video format so just give us a little bit of time after the session today and we'll get it posted up there of course we have our infamous or maybe famous MSP community block parties. We love these. You know, they 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 break glass ceilings every time. I promise you, we're planning several for this year. Just hang tight, and uh, we'll see where we'll see where they end up. But I'm sure you could guess on a couple of them. Then we have our MSP community minds events. Uh, currently set for Dallas and Denver this year, two-day hotel style events where we bring in experts from around the industry to workshop through ideas. We are tired of PowerPoint <laughs> presentations where you walk away and you do nothing. So let's start on something so that you maybe have a chance of finishing something that you haven't finished, fixed, uh, you know, deployed or provisioned inside your organization. Many topics, we're bringing in a bunch of guest speakers there's more being added to this list. Stay tuned. Lastly, is community offers. You know, we've been asking vendors from around the industry. Three have popped up and just thrown some special offers out to the community, but there'll more be coming. Uh, stay tuned here and we'll obviously announce as new community offers pop into the list. That being said, today we bring a special guest on, Jake Carroll, who up until like yesterday coming into this session, I had no clue his journey through the industry, he gave me like a little walk down, you know, kind of preview of his, of his like kind of career here in MSP land. So I definitely want to go down that because quite frankly, sometimes it's nice to know where we came from to figure out how we got to where we are, maybe get an idea of where we're going. I and mean, we could talk all about the things we don't like in the industry. But let's just put that on pause for a yeah. second. Jake, nice, uh, nice to virtually have you on. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, Appreciate it. You have a really intertwined history in MSP. I call it the MSP sandbox. <clears throat> yeah. Not everybody plays nice in the sandbox. That's kind of why nope. I borrowed that theme. But anyway, um, give us give us a walk down memory lane. How did you start here? You know, walk us through your journey. And like, I think people might be surprised how intertwined you are to some of the names that we're familiar with. Yeah. Well, hey, thanks, George. And uh, thanks for having me. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, I'm, I'm here in upstate New York and Albany, and um, it's got a richer uh, technology uh, base than most people would think. So I've been in software companies since I was in my late 20s, quite a long time ago, uh, and never had a move from here. Um, and uh, I've been really, uh, really fortunate in that regard. But what the, the first place where I was kind of in the IT services industry, uh, not just software, um, was when I uh, was an initial investor in Autotask in 2001. So it's it's you know it's you're 22 years ago now. I think about it. Um, um, I had known Bob Godgard from a previous venture. We had both been in together, um, another company that we had um, taken to an exit. Um, and uh, when he first started the company, I was really intrigued by it. It was um, this thing called SaaS back in 2001 was uh, was fairly new. Right? It was so new, as a matter of fact, the software was written in Active Server Pages, if you can, if you can imagine that. So we're, um, you know, it's even pre-HTML. Um, and then, uh, so as original investor in the company, didn't join until 2004 because I was I was already at another software company at the time. And um, decided to join after uh, another Series B investor got in. So first Albany Tech Ventures, which not a lot of people know about either, an Albany-based company that um, had one of the original seats on the NASDAQ and has invested in technology companies here in Albany. Uh, for a really long time and had been a funder uh, and an underwriter of a previous company that I was with that, you know, went public and had an exit as well. So when they came in and said, yeah, we're going to, we're going to kind of give this company our stamp of approval. 
I said, well, okay, it's it's worth the risk of not only having an investment, but my income tied up in this company now, uh, um, which is always something for folks who are getting into early companies and investing and deciding whether they're going to join or not, is how much of your, your personal uh, income risk uh, you want to involve in a company that you're getting involved with. At that point, I felt much better that, you know, it wasn't just, it was well past friends and family round. Um, the, the product which was pre-product when I first invested, right? It was a good enough idea that I really felt like um, it, was, it was a good company to get involved in. And my track record with, uh, with Bob and the other founders was such that um, I felt confident in investing in the company. And, um, you know, like a lot of products that come into the IT channel, this was a product that was um, built originally by a, a local Albany um, MSP uh, for, you know, you know Autotask PSA for, for managing Brilliant. your business. Autotask started out of an MSP? It's interesting. No. So the product did, right? So the product was built by a local MSP in Albany and um, the founders of Autotask partnered with them to say, look, this is a product you could bring to the bigger market, right? Um, and, and that's how it came about. And then ultimately the MSP owner wanted to go back and do MSP things. So Autotask took it over um, completely at that point. But this, the genesis of the Autotask PSA product was, in, was inside a local Albany um, yeah. MSP. It's just amazing how many products that yeah. we see out there. So that's their their path, right? Somebody right. found a problem, a problem, a gap, something was missing, yeah. and they just start building it. If nothing other than to solve their own problem, right. and then it grows. That's exactly right. Most great products, you know, um, solve a problem that someone is personally having, right? Um, and then they realize, well, okay, is it, is it just me, or is there a bunch of people who are having this problem? That and then can you productize it? You know. Um, nobody really thought they needed an Airbnb, uh, for, for themselves yeah. until, you know, two kids in San Francisco said, I can't afford my rent. Um, how do I pay for my rent? Right. So it's amazing how some ideas, the germ of an idea starts, but it, it fundamentally starts with what problem do you solve hmm. and who, and who will pay it, who will pay to solve it. It's interesting in the, I don't know at what point ConnectWise and Autotask in the early days, right. Started kind of yeah. throwing rocks over the fence, you know. <laughs> And I love, I love the Bellini brothers, right? I've talked to them ten, tons of times, yeah, but yeah. I can't tell you how many times somebody's like, you know, you, you'll never believe who sold me Autotask. I remember as a UK guy, he told me this. I was like, who? And I was trying to name early names that I could remember from yeah. Autotask. He's like, Arnie Bellini sold me Autotask. I'm like, how? He's like, he just kept on talking about Autotask. So I figured it must be that good. I'll go and take a look. Interesting. Said, wow. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think it really, you know, we were, you know, obviously we were a new entrant and they'd been in, they'd been in for a while. Um, I don't think it really came to the point where like somebody kind of took up, took notice of us until we landed the exclusive distribution agreement with Ingram Microsystems in their seismic group, which is now the cloud group at Ingram mm -hmm. to be the, to be the PSA of choice in there for their partners to go. So I was like, who are these guys? Um, so that was a huge, you know, sometimes you get, you know, you're a giant already. And sometimes you, you get tall by standing on the shoulders of giants. Uh, that was a really critical uh, relationship for us to um to nail down and, and get going and it gave validity to us as well as some of the other original folks in that program level platforms was in that program vault logic was in that program um uh, and a couple other companies that were really early on um mm. to, to kind of get it going so that's that's kind of where it sort of started um i think also us holding our first customer conference in like 2007 or 8 in in nashville and having the level of attention that we we got on the conference I mean, that's how you, I mean, that's how it all competition all starts, right? It's like if they're a little person, they're an ankle biter, they're, they're nothing until there's something, right? Well, I, I love the word, or I <clears throat> may not love the word ankle biter, but, you know, no. Fred from Kaseya says this all the time, oh, ankle biters. And I'm like, Fred, didn't you just buy a bunch of people? And then like, when you put the rubber band around them, they became not ankle biters. Like, isn't that how it works? But I digress. <laughs> um, yeah. Were you around when, you know, like, Vista and like that group came in and kind of like yeah marketini and like became the CEO. Exactly. That so uh, I'll share a funny story with you. So um I was so I was there from 2004 right up until after the Datto acquisition. So everything with Vista um uh, that happened, I was there for as well. So um interesting story. Like Albany is a small market. We everybody knows everybody, and um I had had a former colleague at at map info which was a geographic information software company that um you know was pretty big here in albany and ended up with 1400 employees and eventually purchased by um, group one um 
uh, software that does uh, and um, Pitney Bowes of all, of all things, right? Um, but one of the things was that I had worked with Kevin Donovan, who was um, who was um, I hired for his first sales job. Um, while we were at Map Info, when he was like a you know a 27 year old kid in accounting that saw commission checks coming across the board and said, "How do I get on this?" So, well, here's how you do it: you start here at the at the as an account manager for our partner channel, and we'll grow from here. Long story short, um, uh, Autotask was looking for uh, another vice president of sales. So, um, I had moved on to manage the Ingram relationship, but we needed someone to manage the day to day uh, sales opportunities in the company. And long story short, that previous company was about to be um, bought again. And, and one of their uh, executives was going to leave. So I reached back into that pool to get Kevin on board to be our vice president of sales at, at Autotask. And lo and behold, um, not too long after that, um, you know, we'd kind of reached the point in 2009 going into 2010, which was, you know, Bob Cogart did, and, and Dick Frederick did an amazing job building the company um, you know, from, the, from the ground up, basically bootstrapped the thing early on. And um, at that point, Mark Catini was going to come in, but Mark had worked with both Kevin and I at Map Info. He was our CEO at Map Info, so it was a it this was a, a small circle. Yeah, here. it's a. You know, I'll tell you what. Once you're in a market and you know people and you trust people and you've built companies together before, um, build sales organizations, build international markets when other people hadn't stepped into those markets, and you've got kind of some muscle memory to do that. Um, it was just a natural fit. As a matter of fact, what I told you about the company that underwrote us at Autotask, which was first Albany Tech Ventures, they were also the company that underwrote us at Map Info when we went public. So, you know, you got your board member there that's your primary investor who's now reaching back and talking to the CEO of the company that he last took public. So it was an, it was kind of an easy transition to bring Mark in. And and very soon after Mark came in, we had a we had a rocket trajectory. The growth of Map Info, or excuse me, for, or Autotask. From 2010 to 2014, when we were when we cashed out with Vista Equity Partners, was really significant. Like you know, two and three times revenue, um, all recurring valuation. Of the company shot from you know, you know, tens of millions to hundreds of millions of dollars uh, in a very short period of time, um, and we were all there for that. So it's pretty exciting. Wow. That included expansion into Europe and uh, Australia, New Zealand. But you know, boots on the ground, not just doing it from arm's length. So <clears throat> I got a couple, yeah. You know, so you were there during the very exciting time of this company. Yeah. I mean, obviously Autotask was a pretty big staple name. And then obviously, you know, got acquired by Data, you know, right. a Vista and their Data's kind of company all came together and like smashed it together. Right. And then obviously <clears throat> the other thing I, I saw in your kind of work down was that you were involved in the RMM acquisition from the company that originally yeah. was based out of the UK, right? Right. So, so yeah. So one of the things about being acquired by Vista Equity Partners was now there's cash to do the kinds of growth that might be, you know, inorganic, right? Acquisitions, mergers, that kind of thing. Um, and the purchase of Centra Stage, which uh, really, you know, vaulted the company through its second second stage of growth from 2014 into 2017 when we were acquired by Dano. Um, that was a piece of the puzzle that we that we were lacking. You know, at Autotask, and this was a great piece of technology. That I'll, I'll tell something else about that. If we hadn't had boots on the ground in our UK operation, which was huge at the, at that point in time, our our international business in the UK and EMEA was, in terms of new business in the door, equal to what was happening here in the US. That's crazy. Right? In a very short period of time, and you know, we learned a and lot. That from, was ban and that was Mark Banfield over Mark there. Mark Banfield, right? yeah. Kevin Donovan went over to the UK to kick it off. Um, and then hired Mark Banfield to um, to run the operation in the UK, and then Mark and Kevin uh, did that. Um, and if we had not been there and seen firsthand, you know, the Centra Stage product, which was based in the UK, I don't know that we would have seen it. The, and the thing about that product that was different from everything else that we'd seen in the marketplace was um, this thing was purpose built to scale, right? It was a cloud based solution, multi tenant, true multi tenant architecture that was purpose built for AWS. And that means in terms of you want to add more endpoints, you want to add more partners, you want to add more data, it was completely unlimited. And what, what it was limited in was a bit of feature set, but it had extensibility and scalability that really no other RMM product had. So we were going to come from ground zero here in the US. It had almost zero penetration here in the US. 
Um, and but we were armed with a great development team, um, the team in the UK for Centra Stage that became, you know, uh, Autotask um, endpoint management product, and then ultimately became that ORMM. Now, um, but the development team there was super smart, um, really knew what they were doing. Um, they had figured out a lot of things about the benefits of the platform, even though it was not as feature rich as the other. So then it was just a matter of let's add some more features to this product and really and really get it to go. So it grew from a zero uh, kind of standstill here in the U.S. from a you know, I say from a you know a zero start um, to a very significant part of our business by the time we ended up selling the data. So let me. So <clears throat> by the way, to be behind the scenes, literally from the product wasn't even on the market yet; it was pre-launch yeah. to not just the Vista investment in the early two, you know, 2010s, but then the actual, you know, kind of sale and merge with Datto. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a full life cycle of a SaaS company. Let me ask you, a, really couple targeted, yeah, let me ask you sure. a couple of targeted questions that I would even be interested in, but like just generally speaking, right? Like <clears throat> how difficult is it in the early days to get people to come on board and stay on board? Mm-hmm. Is part of the strategy early stage to like, do the whole, hey, if you stick around long enough, you'll give you some equity into the company yeah. or how does how does that successfully work in the early stage? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, a couple of things in terms of hiring and understanding who you're bringing on board is it certainly helps to have people that you know that have done it, that have done it before, um, that kind of know the footprint and how this thing's going to go. The other thing is you have to have people who wear multiple hats early on. There's just, you, just, you know, you don't have the most, you um, targeted job descriptions all the time. You could be doing marketing one day, you could be doing sales the next, you could be doing channel one day, you could be doing direct the next. Um, so you got to have people that 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 want to do that. Um, the as a well here's the thing as a person coming into the company, you got to check the the financials. Like it really it really needs to add up. Like it doesn't have to be a profitable company, but you should be really asking yourself the question of like if you have investors and you have cash and you're kind of doing a land grab and you're not necessarily profitable yet, you got to know what the runway looks like. Uh, you know, when does the cash run out if we don't sell anything? I think those are the kinds of things that are super important. And I, you know, from a management perspective, I know, like, I can tell you that multiple times a week we were in meetings and we, and cash flow was a part of every single meeting we were in. It just was. And as you know, from starting a business yourself, like, you can't grow without cash. There's just no other way to do it. You either have to borrow it or you got to make it. There's just, you can't hire people, you can't buy stuff. And so you have to have cash flow, and, and you know that's expensive. <laughs> that's expensive. For sure. So um, you, you yeah. went through a 2008 dyna- financial drop, obviously, yeah. on the map, and then, and then more more recently we had COVID and what came after COVID. Yeah. But talk to me for a second about run rate, right? Like we've seen yeah. companies recently who were gangbusters. You thought they were at the arena with the T-shirt cannon and the money gun, yeah. and then all of a sudden, like they just cut 30 percent of the company. You know, like. What, what's going on there? As I guess as you bring outside investors, <clears throat> at some point, can they flip the switch if things aren't on track or how does that yeah. work? Well, um, it usually has a lot to do with the, your visibility in the runway. If you, for instance, calculated that, you know, at current, current course and speed, what we're selling and what we're spending and what we have in the bank is going to last us X, 24 months, 36 months, whatever that number happens to be. If there's an economic change that happens that uh, kind of upsets that apple cart, right? Sales start to trail off a little bit because people are getting a little more tight with cash. You know, whatever that happens to be. Interest rates go up on loans you took, so you got more payout. Um, I think that's when if you have financial advisors or you have investors or you, you even have a good sense of fiscal um, uh, uh, hygiene, you got to look and you got to say, okay, the money we expected to last X is now going to ask why unless we take measures right and those things can change pandemic changed things really quickly right i mean people were cash was cheap investment was happening people were expanding staff hiring way ahead of of profit in many cases for startups um and you know that's going to be challenging startups right now are going to are going to have a challenge if they if they can't make their cash run cuz you know who knows what's happening but um, that's really the biggest thing when you're running a small company and you're bootstrapping it, or you've got a, you know, some small investments is, you know, what's the runway and can you take the, make the critical decisions about, you know, is headcount right? Do we need to, do we need to reset? Um, I know what we did with our, with our customers back then in 2008, when the financial crisis hit is we offered, 
and remember for us, that was post um, investment from First Albany Tech Ventures. So we had cash. So we, we were able to ride through that and actually grow through that period. But a lot of our customers, MSPs around the country, they were struggling a little bit with stuff. So we had like a, um, I'll say a scholarship program or a, you know, we'll cut your fee in half for a little, for, for a while while you figure yourself out. Um, and, and we did that for a while. That was kind of an interest free, you don't have to pay us back. Like we're going to kick this thing back so you can kind of just ride this wave out. And, you know, I'm going to say a hundred or so MSPs took advantage of that. And probably six to 12 months was the leeway period. And, um, you know, they stuck with us over that. So, Again, you know, commitment to your customers, you know, understanding your financial responsibilities, and and uh, just knowing what that what that horizon looks like, it's just super important. You just have to discipline to do the right thing. So when Vista came in, a lot of people in the industry call it the the blueprint, the playbook, the the run book, right? Like they come yeah. in and just say, "Hey, everything goes out the door. You put a binder on the table. This is what we're doing now." How true is that? Um, I think it depends on the maturity of your management team, right? Okay. We we were we were on a trajectory that um, that Vista recognized as a pretty positive one, right? Marketing is going in as a veteran CEO. Um, he, he at the size that uh, Autotask was when Vista invested in market only already managed and grew companies ten times that size, and um, and had and, and by the way ten times that size, but starting from where we were right now. Right. So he'd seen the whole thing. It wasn't like this was somebody coming in who, you know, knew how to run a four hundred million dollar business. This is how this is someone who knew how to start with a forty million dollar business and turn it into four hundred million. Right. So and that's a that's a different kind of skill set and muscle, uh, muscle memory there to kind of do that. Um so for us, we you know, look, we hear all the stories too. Vista comes in with their playbook and here it is, you gotta go run with it. For the most part, Vista came in with, to us with their playbook too, but um we were able to say, like, yeah, we're doing this, we're doing that. Here are the checkpoints. Um, Vista Equity Groups, their consulting group, VCG, um, is super helpful. I mean, like there's there's best practices all over the place to take advantage of. If you're a company that's um, not quite as mature as we were in terms of operational maturity um, and didn't have a lot of things in place, there is a ton to learn from their teams um, when they come in. Um, and we learned a lot from, you know, you think about this in your own business, George, or any other MSP. If you can hire level one technicians and train the heck out of them and grow them into your level two and three technicians. That's a great career path for a young technician and an engineer. It's also great in terms of the company, in terms of spend and management and best practice. You know, that's one of the things that Vista brought to us, which was, hey, look, if you're hiring, particularly when you're hiring salespeople, um, if you try to hire um, sauce, software as a service sales veterans that have a great track record, you're going to pay a fortune for those bodies. You just are. I mean, they're not they're not cheap folks, but if you take um, uh, what we used to call hipples, you know, high impact young folks who are really super smart, um, and you can train them, you can bring in we brought in classes of twelve to fourteen salespeople a month early on, um, put them through boot camp of four to six weeks, mentor them with sales management and team leaders around them, and that was something that Vista brought to the table to us that was hugely successful, but. I guess the short answer to your question is it kind of depends on what your operational maturity level is like when they come in, how good is your management team? And uh, ultimately, you know, good advice is hard to get, right? Um, and uh, cause you know, there's a lot of people out there that want to give advice. They don't really know what they're talking about. This had a great oh. track record and, and not for nothing. Um, that process to um, figure out um, that exit for Autotask in 2010, there were a lot other um, PE companies involved in that process, and all not the, the cash isn't the only thing that's evaluated when you're when you're going to be bought by somebody. Culture value, because the money's the money, right? It, it, the 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 multipliers are what they are. These guys all know the game. You're not going to get dramatically more money from someone than you are from someone else, and it's really then about culture fit, direction, um, you know, value that the PE brings to the table, you know, what's their track record been? So, and, and Mark and the executive team at Autotest was really good at selecting the right partners. So <clears throat> there's no question, and I agree with you, that you guys went international early, early, mm -hmm. early. Yeah. If anything, you if you talk to the guys at ConnectWise, they they were trying to do all Behind this us. international sales from the U.S., no. And then no. they realized that you guys were just crushing it. And then like, they yeah. kind of came in behind you. So like, 
I know every market's a little bit different, right? And I know mm-hmm. even now, like there's a little bit of grayness, right? Just because of, you know, the, you know, financial situation globally, but it just seems like, you know, you can only do so much from remote, right? Yeah. I mean, Europe, Australia, yeah. New Zealand, right? Like, you get in yes. yeah, even Canada to some degree, right? Like it seems mm-hmm. like boots on the ground is the only way to progress those markets. I, I think in international markets in particular, because um, you have to think about um, sales culture and buying culture um, in those regions too. It's different than here. Like we were in the US with Autotask, we were all very comfortable going to trade shows, selling over the phone with Zoom or WebEx or whatever it was we were doing back in the day. And when we landed in the UK and put people on the ground, we found that the most effective way to sell there was um coffee in the morning uh learning sessions lunch and learns taking people to football games or rugby games matches those kinds of things but being out in front of people was hugely important to the point where it's the experience that we had in the uk and building that team and building out EMEA and doing all that local selling was the impetus for us to get our office in chicago get our office in dallas get our office in southern california and get out into the field with msps um Again, you would think like, man, that's a huge expense. But in in terms of, you know, money back in the door, you know, every dollar of recurring revenue multiplies by six times. You know, at the end of the at the end of the um, horizon, right? So, that investment is it's it's high risk, but it's high reward if you get it right. And again, you know, I don't recommend it for anybody who hasn't done it before, right? If you haven't like, you know, started a new office in a foreign country and know how the customs work, how the taxes work. You know, all those kinds of things are really important. Didn't hurt that Mark Tini is a native of the UK, right? And the previous company that I mentioned we worked with together started out there as VP of international sales located in Windsor in the UK. Um, but Mark had, you know, he started markets for um, uh, for Lotus back in the day, back in Eastern Europe, um, South Africa, a variety of different countries. So he actually knew the footprint inside and out. And the people that we hired in the UK and in Benelux and in, in the Nordics we're all people that we'd worked with before that had started, you know, uh, sales offices in those locations. So again, what you know, who, you know, <laughs> you know I was like, going to say, yeah, it sounds like yeah, that is the, the, no name question. Of the game. Like you guys had literally like five steps up because you were already working with people that already knew the game. Yeah. Yeah. It's really important. Yeah. But you see that now, right? You see like who everybody who's left whatever company has been acquired, whether it's data, whether it's ConnectWise, and all their new kind of adventures that they're all in, they're all bringing, they're all bringing peers they work with before. Right. It's hard to you start know what you're going to get when, when you're already uh, behind yeah. the eight ball when everybody else has been around. Right. Bring, yeah. Bring the people, you know. Yeah. hundred percent. Let's talk about OSR manage. What what's yeah. happening there? This is currently what you're doing day to day. Yeah. I don't know if people um, have heard that name, um, obviously, as, as much as the other companies out there. Tell sure. us a little bit about it. So um, OSR manage has an has a great kind of history. And I was really intrigued by what. Um, what Rob Rogers and Tim McNeil were doing here at the company, which was when I joined, they were, I, they were doing outsourced sales management for MSPs, right? I'm like, oh, tell me about that model. Well, if you work with MSPs, which I had, and all of us who are vendors in this space know that the, the, one of the bigger single, single biggest challenges for MSPs is building a sales and marketing presence out that gets beyond the I, owner I, of the I business. I honestly think it's a foreign language, Jake. Yeah. I don't think MSPs know how to sell at all. I mean, you know, the guys that, yeah. I'm not saying that an owner can't go in and, you know, pitch the customer, but like, once you have to get past that person, yes. I think it's just like a grenade, either it goes off on you or you got lucky. There's a, and a, by, by the way, the effort and money being spent by MSPs to figure this thing out is substantial. Right. Um, and what Rob and Tim had, you know, they had first started off as just like a lead gen service. Let's go out and, you know, appointment set for guys that had a call center in Connecticut with 40 people in it setting appointments and um, they decided to pivot the business to a bit of a different model, which was if we, if we can help MSPs recruit, train and manage uh, a new salesperson or help take over if the sales team's just gotten a little bit too big and the principal doesn't want to take away time from running the rest of the business to dedicate it to sales, that there is a, there's certainly a problem here in the space, right? Again, start with a problem. Like what's the problem? Like getting, getting to that next level. Right. And, and, you know, M- any principal in an MSP company will tell you that, like, there's only so much that an owner can do in terms of whether it's reference sales. Um, and you get to that point where, you know, maybe you get to a million, two million, three million. It's like, okay, how do I get over this hump? Like, what am I going to do? And look, we're, the fact of the matter is when you're selling locally or regionally a technology services product, 
increasing your sales is almost entirely a rep driven model. Like how many, how many bodies do you have, can you throw at this? Efficiency and automation is really, really important. But there, you, you really can't do it without more, more people. And um, most MSP owners have really refined sales pitch, right? They know, they, they know what to talk about um, to a small business owner, a medium-sized business owner about what it is they do for a business and how it's going to benefit them. Owners have this built-in empathy already. You're a small business owner. I'm a small business owner. I got to make payroll. You got to make payroll. We both want to mitigate risk. We're both working here in the local community. We're in the same rotary. You know, we're going to the same chamber events. Um, you know, I am you. So it's built-in empathy and a great pitch. And the challenge, and the thing that we do at uh, OSR Manage is we come in and say like, okay, Mr. Principal of your business, what do you want to do? Do you just need more appointments so you can go do your thing? I'll hire you an SDR. We'll train them. They'll come into our boot camp. We'll manage them day to day. All the KPIs, metrics, accountability, talk track, listening in on the calls and coaching and mentoring, having those weekly one-on-ones, getting them into a sales peer group with, with other folks, and then giving the owner of the business a report, just like we would. If I were your VP of sales, this is what I'd be delivering to you. That's what you want to do. Great. If they really want to kind of, you know, I want to get out of the sales process, then we're, we're talking about hiring for them more of a hybrid sales rep, someone that has an appetite for prospecting, but also has the maturity or the ability to learn over time how to how to scope a deal, how to bring in technical resource to do assessments, how to come back and then after that assessment's done, go do a, a quote and a proposal and then present that thing effectively and close deals. So we'll help them with both, but um, as a company, and we do it as a, as a fractional basis on a recurring revenue basis. So rather than one of the real challenges is they may not have the systems expertise to hire and manage salespeople, but to hire a sales manager and a salesperson is cost prohibitive based on, you know, if you take a regular 13 to 15% of gross revenues and put those towards sales and marketing, you know, do the math. If you're a $2 million business, that means you've got about $150,000 to spend on this thing. That's a, before it starts to get a little wacky, right. In terms of the percentages of your business. So having us as the sales management team, um, on a fractional basis, on a monthly recurring number that's, you know, frankly, we have a one-year agreement, but, you know, anybody who, if it doesn't work, we can't find a hire for you, you don't like the color of my sweater today, whatever, we just kind of like, let's part friends and, and move on. But um, ultimately, um, it's a grind, right? And uh, people who have hired sales reps and said, I'm going to hire, the, you know, I'm going to, you know, all the myths, right? He's an outgoing person. He's been a sale. He's got a successful track record before. Um, let's bring him in, but like, can he cold call? Will he follow up with an email? How is he in an event? Um, you know, do you, can you really manage that person? And usually they be, fail, right? They I'm going to be honest with you, Jake. I, I've seen so many permutations of this conversation in terms of whether it's from the vendor side, hiring SaaS, whether it's yeah. from the MSP side, hiring sales. By the way, I, I love the people who do try to cross the aisle. It's a different it's a different story. It doesn't always yeah. mesh, to be honest. It, no. Frankly, it fails more than it works. The, the um, key thing with hiring salespeople is not, not if they've been successful before mm -hmm. or um, if they will do the job, but can they sell your product at your price in your market? It's, it's just something you, and you never get it right 100% of the time, right? I had the benefit at Autotask. We were hiring you know, um, incoming sales groups of 12 people. I knew a third of them were going to drop out. But yeah. MSPs don't have the luxury of hiring yeah. three people and see who works. Right. So, you know, the recruiting part is something that we do um, and we don't always get it right, but our, our percentages are much higher because we've done it so many times. But I have to tell you that our best relationships with our partners and success rate is when we recruit a good salesperson. <laughs> That's really what it comes down to. So, so is it some people, some sales, <coughs> some sales leaders, CRO people out there don't feel one second. don't feel like they can successfully merge those tasks into one individual, meaning outbound prospecting, calling, hammering the phones, <clears throat> then getting into booked appointments and actually like yeah. going through the formal kind of closer role. Yeah. And then, and then afterwards the sales done, like who sits in account management? Like yeah. they, they, they tell me all the time, you got to break those three roles apart into separate people. If you, you, I mean, obviously as an MSP, maybe they can't afford those three roles. Oh, so how does that right. work? I think you got to start with the most, the quickest way to revenue, right? And in many, we'll come in and evaluate, like we'll say, 
give me your white space analysis. What's your white space analysis? Show me all of your customers and all the services that they're currently consuming. How does that add up to your current stack? Are they 50% penetrated? Are they 100% penetrated? You know, what's the white space opportunity within your current customer base? If it represents at a fraction of the white space, if it represents what their growth goals are over the next 24 months, we're going to say hire account manager, right? Okay. We're, right? Um, if they've kind of, you know, they're all in MSP, everything's included in their one price fee for 250, 300, 400 bucks a month, depending on, you know, where you're going geographically. Um, and everybody's all in and there's not a lot of white space, we're going to say like, okay, your growth is going to be limited to two things. The organic growth of your customers, check current course and speed, who's hiring, who's growing, you know, what do you got in your normal customer base? If you can't sell more services, what's your organic growth look like, All right? If you take your organic growth, you know, from your, your goal, then you're going to get like how much you have to get through net new customers in the door. And that formula never changes, right? It's eight first time appointments to six technical meetings to four proposals to one win. It just, it doesn't change that much, right? Uh, particularly in competitive marketplaces. So then you just have to back into the numbers. All right, first thing we need, if the owner wants to stay in sales is we need an appointment setter in here or a hybrid. You know, if we have someone who we think we can train into the role, that's ideal. Um, I, the only, the only um, caveat I would add to your original point is I, I do believe that there's room for someone who starts as an appointment setter with the right sales training to move into an account executive role, right? But it's iterative, iterative, have to learn by the side of the owner. What's the pitch? What's it sound like? How do I work with my technical teams? Am I a really good utilizer of resource? Um, I can't go this alone. I don't have the, probably don't have the technical wherewithal to do it. That's the other thing that the owners have. They can sell and they have all the back end technical knowledge from the way they got into the business. They know how this all works and they've seen everything. Translating that into a salesperson is really hard, right? Is really hard to do. So we create all sorts of tools to say, I need to get what's in your head, your experience, your customer stories. And I need to get that into a playbook and a battle card for your salesperson that we just need to pound into them uh, over time. Um, not easy, right? There's the, the other thing is like, there's very rarely going to be a salesperson that you can hire into your business that's going to do it as well as you do, particularly if you've been successful. So it's almost like if Michael Jordan were a coach, you're not going to be as good as you. You got to figure out a way to work with this, right? Doesn't mean they can't be great. Just means they're not going to be you, right? So a little bit of tolerance in that regard too. And I think that's where, where we come in as, uh, as a management voice is, look, we've seen this before. This person's good. Not you, but good. So um, here's how we need to get them to the next phase. So uh, your, your point is, is well taken there. It's like, yeah, I, I would agree with you on one point. Separate yeah. account management from new logos because once somebody gets the taste of selling into the base, they are not making a cold call. Yeah. It's too easy. I say it's too easy. It's relatively easy compared to the hump of getting a new logo. Fair, fair. So <clears throat> do you, I mean, all MSP owners, I believe, whether we're talking about sales, whether we're talking about marketing, whether we're talking about lead gen, pick whatever name you want to it. Yeah. Kind of impatient. They yeah. sometimes don't have the runway yeah. that maybe you're looking for in order to like get to an actual <clears throat> like. Yeah. place where things are working what's the time frame like oh, average i know it's different be, all the time yeah this starts with brutal candor right um yeah so let me give you an idea we're, we're pretty data driven as far as this goes we've evaluated two million phone calls over the last two years and we know that with marketing alone without a cold caller on the back end or a salesperson to follow up that you're about two thousand dollars per appointment right if you're just doing phone calls and not supported with marketing you're going to be around $1,900 for your first time appointment, right? Counterintuitive, spend on both, reduce your cost to appointment to under $1,000, right? So your point about they want immediate results, that stuff takes some time, right? I mean, think about this for a minute. So let's suppose we hire a new salesperson today and the pipeline is bare, mm -hmm. right? You've got, we go out and help them source a list of say a thousand businesses that are within their geographical reach, fit their ideal customer profile. These are people they want to sell to. And this salesperson is going to start at ground zero tomorrow calling through that list. Let's suppose they do 80, you know, 80 calls a day. Well, the fact is if it's a new sales rep, they got to figure out systems. They got to figure out their pitch. They're probably going to ramp from 40 calls a day in the first three to four weeks to 50 calls a day in the next, you know, five to eight weeks, and then finally get to that ramp of 80 calls. Right. So, um, you're going to take a while to get through this list and start getting some appointments, right? And again, we go through that eight, six, four, one 
number we talked about earlier, eight first time appointments to six technical assessments to whatever. In a perfect scenario, you find somebody that wants to have a first time meeting. They have your first time meeting, they want to go to a technical assessment. Complete the assessment, they want you to, they love it, they want you to do a proposal. Whatever your sales cycle is, your active sales cycle, okay, add that on to the first day you start calling to get those appointments. So look, there's a, a people are desperate to figure this thing out, right? They want to grow the business and they'll try, they try a bunch of things. They'll do Market Toby, they'll do Robin Robbins, they'll do our stuff, they'll do the, the peer groups, they'll just they'll try, just they'll hire a digital marketer, right? They'll update the website, they'll do SEO. It's a lot of spend, right? Um, and the key thing is, you know, we we tell our MSP owners, like, we are don't plan on selling anything for five or six months. Five or six months. Now, I will tell you that, like, you know, catch lightning in a bottle, get the right prospect, not not happy with their current provider or internal IT, and they just lost their manager, and instead of hiring one, they want to go outsource. You're going to catch lightning in a bottle if you're doing doing Agreed. the exercise, right? But even if you've right got a time, 60 right day place. sale, even if you got a right, right time, right, yeah, right place, right time. And even if you have a 60 day sales cycle where people have to make a decision or they need to get out of a contract or whatever, I mean, that's the thing. Now, on the other hand, if you've got just an appointment setter that's given the owner the appointments and the owner, you don't have to worry about, you know, the, uh, the training. It's just a matter of sales cycle and getting a few things in the door. Look, I tell people five or six months so they know like this is a hump in particular for hiring a rep. All right. Let's suppose I'm starting for ground zero. They don't even have a rep. So I got to go recruit first. Right. So if we have to recruit and find a salesperson and that takes, you know, we used to be able to do it in about 47 days. COVID made it miserable. It, it jumped up to almost 65 to 80 days to find a, a good candidate. It's coming back down a bit now. We can find folks a little bit, a little bit sooner. But I've got to, you know, so I've got to find them 60 days. I got to train them two more weeks. I got to ramp them. Right. So, and if you got a 60 day sales cycle, that's four months. Yeah. All right. So the reality of it is the reason why we start with companies that are not early, early, early stage. Um, it's very rare that we would work with someone who's under a million dollars, probably a million and a half to two would be ideal in terms of where you start is that, you know, this is you're 150 grand into this, right? You got to go 100 to 150 grand. You got to go spend to get it. And, um, you know, we know that a first time appointment takes 300 calls. If it's not backed up with marketing, we can get it down to 150 if there's marketing. And um, mm. so you, you have to really go into this with um, with open eyes about how what the expense handle, is going to be and what the time is. How do you handle the remote work thing? Because I, you know, I hear from, again, sales leaders all the time. Yeah. Hey, if they're working remote and they're not kind of like a veteran and they haven't been, they know what they need to do, you probably got to fail on that person because some of the like excitement osmosis learning process yeah. happens because you're next to someone, right? Yeah. So how does that work on your front? That's, a, that's important. So um, for us, that's not an issue. We manage everybody remotely. Um, we prefer to hire them close to the um, MSP's location. In particular, if we're trying to grow someone, you know, into a more advanced rep than just an appointment center. So getting that company culture, listening in on tech support calls, being in the office, understanding the business, being local to the MSP is really, really important. Um, most of our MSPs are still in a hybrid, work from home a couple of days a week, work in the office three days a week. Um, there's a lot of truth serum in systems. Right. Um, we we have systems that track calls, that schedule calls, that um, schedule emails, um, that record calls. We do call evaluations, right, to make sure the reps are saying the right things, representing the company well. So there's really not a there's really not any place to hide. You know what we do it, a lot of times with MSPs is like this is the only salesperson they have. So what we do is we create peer groups that are non-competing geographies that are in the same exact sales role. So they kind of become your team, right? I got you know we had six people sales peer group where appointment setters for six different MSPs around the country can come in and, you know, share success stories or lament their woe of being hung up on 42 times today. Um, and, and that helps bring a sense of community around what we do. Um, but, but to your point about remote versus um, on-site, if I thought there was a big sales bullpen where they could hear other people selling and they could get that kind of messaging down, I'd say, yeah, that's a huge advantage. But in, in many cases, we're one or two salespeople inside an MSP. Um, it's more for some of the bigger ones that we work with, but ultimately, um, only so much you can get out of, out of that. And and you can't if you're if you're really dedicated to tech, and you put great systems in, you can get a lot of that even if the employee is remote, right? That culture will translate. How do you? And this one is like a science to its own, but like 
how do you figure out how to comp these people, right? I mean, yeah. everybody has so, a different idea on what the best do. way is. So. so again, it's all in the data, right? There's there's enough people looking for jobs in similar markets, similar positions around the country. So do Indie, do salary.com, do Glassdoor and say, I need to know what a senior sales executive for IT sales looks like in Cleveland, Ohio. Give you the data. Um, and, you know, based on experience, those kinds of things, because one of the things that's really important about recruiting, if you don't want to get a bunch of really bad resumes or folks that are overshoot the runway in terms of your comp is you got to be transparent in your, in your, in your compensation and your job posting. Right. So you're attracting the people that you want. If you're going to have an entry level salesperson out of the gate, you know, uh, you're going to pay an entry level salary. You don't want somebody with three to five years experience. Like, don't tell me it's entry level, but then make one of the requirements a degree in three to five years experience. Right. So you got to write these things um, really well. So it's all in the data. You know, um, stuff changes over time. We do we do salary searches every time we do a hire. So every time we bring on a new MSP that wants us to recruit for them, we do another salary search in that geography for that role. Um, and then we come back with the range. And we tell you know the MSP owner, like, here's what the range is. Here's what we recommend. Um, this is going to be the base. This is about what the variable should be in the range. We think you're going to get this many resumes if we go with this range. If you go to the top end of the range, you're probably going to get more resumes. And then it comes down to, you know, what do you want to pay for the daily posting on Indeed or whatever is you're you're um, you're using. Um, but that's how you do it. And and comp in this business isn't as complex as people think it is. Particularly if it's a re if it's a recurring revenue model, we go with a very straight. If you're a sales rep that's going to do self sourcing of your leads and close a deal, you can get 100% of first month's recurring revenue. If you're going to be an appointment setter for the business owner great. And they're going to go out and close the business. You're going to get an activity bonus for the kinds of things you do every day. You know, we kind of gamify it with a hundred point a day scale throughout the month. Um, and they'll get a small uh, part of, you know, they get a small, you know, 500 buck a month, uh, you know, Vig for, for doing that, but they'll split that deal 25, 75 with the owner or whoever the other senior salesperson is there. If they're reporting it, you know, occasionally, if it's a company that's still selling, you know, project services, you know, based on size of project, we'll throw in a bogey on that, but we keep it super simple. So the employee knows exactly what they're getting paid for and what we want them to do, which is net new customers at recurring revenue project are nice, but this other thing here called recurring revenue drives the, you know, drives the, drives the boat. Um, keep it simple. Uh, you know, as they say, the dogs will eat where you put the dog food. So put it where you want them to go. Yeah, don't make it uh, and don't overcomplicate it. it out. Yeah. Don't overcomplicate it. Yeah. I've seen very, very complicated comp schedules, and I'm like, you need an Excel spreadsheet and a formula to figure this out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't uh, do that. <clears throat> Brian pops in and says, "Ask Jake if he was at CAD Overlay." Alone. I was. I've met. So I was looking at the people attending this. So Brian Ricky, who was a who was in in your uh, uh, was a partner of mine at a pre my first company that I worked with Bob Gardgard at back in 1989, believe it or not, wow. for six years was a company called CAD Overlay and we did an add-on product for AutoCAD. So if you were an engineer and you wanted to take your big, large format drawings and put them into AutoCAD, you needed to scan them and the image needed to come up and it was really highly technical on really, really slow computers. Um, and Brian was a partner of ours back then. So yeah, and if wow. I remember correctly, Brian's in uh, Indi near Indianapolis, I think, if I'm not mistaken. So yeah, long time ago. Good to see Small you. Small worlds. Oh yeah. So I'll tell you, I had another, I had another person that I worked with in that previous company his name was Jeff Middleton and he was out of uh, Louisiana and I went to my first uh, it may have been um, SMB Tech Fest maybe yeah. it was in, in New Orleans like 100 years ago it seems like and I walk in a room and I hear a presenter and I'm like man that voice sounds familiar to me and lo and behold it's a guy who was a partner in this previous business long ago and I remember my only relationship to him previously was over the phone and I recognized his voice I didn't even see what it was wow small what, world what, here where, where, so, man, you seems like you. I mean, you go back to the early infancy, yeah. <clears throat> early two thousands. Now, you know, you've got you. You've seen the the successful exit of Autotask. You know, you're now on the other side of the whole the whole story. Yeah. For uh, Brian says Evansville, by the way. Evansville. Uh, <clears throat> the world seems to be at least at the top end, Jake. Consolidating. And there's some new people popping up, yeah. you know, on the other yeah. side of MSP land from out of MSPs, like you say, mm -hmm. kind of who started to ask companies moving up. Just curious on your, I guess, prognostication on where things go from here, because, you know, there seems to just be, you know, I don't know, square peg round hole to some degree versus how these bigger companies that have now consolidated up are like doing day-to-day -day business practices. 
versus how the MSPs, you know, are willing to or to not do business versus how they're turning around and doing their agreements with their end customers. It doesn't all seem to be aligned. What's going on? Yeah. So, um, you know, MSPs align with businesses and vendors that align with their culture, their billing, their customers, their, their needs and wants, right? Um, and when acquisitions occur, there's always like, in, in, in the very, very best cases, the cultures kind of align, right? The data and auto task culture is really aligned well. I'm totally honest with you. Like we had a, we both love partners. The differences were, you know, product sales and backup and disaster recovery versus a platform, right? And um, Datos was a, um, a sell through the channel. Autotask was a sell to the channel. So it's different. Like, so our salespeople um, were mostly enterprise salespeople selling to someone a, a very, you know, an important part of running their business. And, and Datto was a, um, had, a, had an amazing uh, backup and disaster recovery product and some other suites. But cultures were pretty well aligned. I mean, there was, there's the, always the fallout at the executive level, right? Like who's staying, who's going, who's going to run the company, all those kinds of things. And there's a definite source of friction there. And in, in many cases, MSPs that have been on board with Autotask for a while, man, they have personal relationship with the executives in that company. Oh, yeah. Right? So there's always the fear that like this, the bottom's going to drop out now. Everything's going to change. They're going to go to multi-year agreements. Like this is never going to be, I'm never going to get a hold of anybody again to help me with my, my technical resource question. And I, you know, my thing is like, well, let's see, right? I mean, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater right away. It, take a take a breath, look and see, right? Your people, you know, people um, kind of um, expose themselves fairly quickly as to how you're going to be treated, what's going to happen with your contracts, and all those kinds of things. I I do think that most people in in the acquisition community, whether that's merging companies, try to put companies together that have great synergies. Right. The 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 term they use is a tuck in. Right. Like um, Centra stage was the perfect tuck in for auto task. Right. Um, and they needed, you know, they needed exposure here in the U.S. We had a big partner channel. We needed an RMM to tie with the PSA to kind of compete with everybody else in the marketplace. It was, you know, hand in glove in terms of that fit. Um, but when you when you see these really big ones, I mean, they're not easy to do. I mean, it's a lot of people. I mean, particularly that on Kaseya. That's got to be 5,000, 6,000 people. Like, I, that's a big ask. Um, but I, I also think that companies like Vista that put those deals together, or Francisco Partners, or who, whoever it is that uh, uh, Toma Bravo, whoever funds those and um, examines those for fit, for market um, potential, um, you know, they're still in it, right? They're looking to make money on the next thing, you know, when whatever it happens. So they do their very, very best with their experience. Um, to put companies together that have synergy um, and, you know, sometimes cultures clash. Um, you know, I know, I know the Dado and Kaseya cultures early on seemed like that was a, that was a big clash. Um, but I think everybody does their best to try to make it all work. Right. It's just some, sometimes, you know, the way you build your company is different the way somebody else built it. And, you know, it, uh, you get some friction and then ultimately there's fallout and then there's a settling in and then you figure it out from there. But uh, I, I'm trying to think if I've seen square peg round hole where things just didn't align. I mean, I was as surprised as anybody on the data Caseo thing, um, just because they've just been such big competitors for so long. Right. Um, but you know, that's the thing with strategic acquisitions, right? They are almost always, you know, gobbling up a competitor to consolidate the market. Right. I mean, it's it'll just be, the way it'll it goes. Be, it'll be interesting to see like, you know, <clears throat> obviously you're working with a lot of MSPs that are trying to grow. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they're all selling three-year contracts to their MSP accounts, or I guess as big as, as long as they can get four, five, ten, whatever. Yeah. I yeah. mean, usually once you get into, I don't know, I know as everybody defines SMB differently. Let's just call it a hundred or below in this case. Yeah. People below that hundred user mark tend not to want to lock into the long-term contract. So now all of a sudden you're in a Hey, we're going to work to each with each other until we don't want to work anymore, and then yeah. I need I need to be able to exit within an X period of time. Sure. You know, it doesn't quite align with the well. Hey, everything you buy here from the vendors three years, so you know, yeah. all of a sudden it's like you know that's where there's a, a mismatch. I think I think alignment is always the most important thing with any kind of buyer seller relationship, whether you're you're forming a new partnership with a new vendor or whether you're acquiring a new customer. If you're an MSP and you're selling multi-year agreements and your competitors aren't selling multi-year agreements or selling month to month, 
you've got to be armed and ready to know what the benefits of a multi-year agreement are. Not to you as a company who wants to exit at some point, but to your customer. Why does it matter to them? And you've got to tell that story in a story arc of another customer, right? You can't tell it from your perspective because nobody cares. They just don't. If you can't be the voice of your customer when you're trying to justify a multi-year agreement and your customer is saying risk, 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 you're saying, no, it's got to be reward, reward, reward. Your projects are included. Your uh, pricing's locked in. Um, you get a higher level of service. Um, you're leaving your current provider that was month to month. For what reasons, right? Those kinds of things, right? It, whatever it is, whether it's multi-year agreements, whether it's higher cost per person per month for the service, if you can't articulate to the voice of your current customers the value that you bring and that this new customer will be able to experience, it's really, really hard to get that point across because look, here's the thing. MSPs are really savvy at picking up a great new vendor, right? They just know it. They've been around long enough. They probably vet 10, 15 new vendors a year anyway. So they know it. But think about this from an MSP's perspective. What are the chances that a, a business owner for an engineering firm, law office, accountant firm really knows the difference from one MSP to another? I don't know. They're here in 24-7, 365. We're going to do patch management. We're going to keep you up and going at our help desk. You guys are going to be boop, 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 boop. And they go, oh, this guy's 150 bucks a month and you're 250. I have no idea what the difference is, right? They don't, they don't know just because they don't know. It's, a, it's like me. If I were trying to hire a level two versus level three tech, I would have no idea the difference. Those people could snowball me all day. I'm going to think, I don't know how to do it. You got to know what the, the uh, intelligence level is of your customer and be able to articulate it in their terms why you're worth 250 if your competitor's only at 150. And I think that goes the same way when you're picking vendors. Are they aligned with what you do? If you're a person that sells month to month agreements, because I want to prove my value every day to my customers. And if they want to leave, they can leave. If I don't do a great job, then you just have to find a way to, you know, find vendors that share that um, value with you. There's really no other way around it. 100%. How do people find uh, more about OSR Manage? How do they contact you? Get more yeah. information? All of that. Oh, yes. thanks. Thanks for that. Um, we are, you can come to our website at OSR, OSRmanage.com. Um, or you can always contact me, you know, Jay Carroll at OSRmanage.com. You can find me on LinkedIn. Um, any of the folks here are probably already connected to me, but you know, standard way, find our website, you know, give us a call. Um, and if you're in Taylor business group, they know who we are. We've got members, we've got customers that are in that group. If you're in any of the other peer groups, Evolve or um, MSP, Ignite, or any of the other peer groups that are out there, um, we've got members in there if you need to get some customer feedback. Or Robin Robbins. There's a lot of overlap between Robin Robbins folks who are investing in marketing but need sales management on the back end to take advantage of the spend you're making there. That's awesome. the best way to get us. Find us in the marketplace. We don't do a lot of trade shows. Those are super expensive. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but, but we do a few. Um, and uh, that you'll see us out there doing that. We do um, for the Evolve group, we're subject matter experts on for sales. So if you're in that group, there's a new sales sales peer group. You know, uh, call your uh, your Evolve rep and get into that group. We're doing a session next week, actually, on on how to do a great discovery call. So awesome, Jake! It was us. really nice learning about. You know, you, you have a pretty cool seat in the, you know from a history standpoint on mm -hmm. some of how this all came together in MSP land. And uh, yeah, this topic, I mean, I, I, I've, been, I've been hearing about it going back to 2000, yeah. right? Nobody, nobody seems to have the magic crystal ball, silver bullet, magic yeah. wand, whatever it is. And like everybody struggles with it. So yeah. maybe it's time to do something different because the definition of insanity is to do Doing the same, same thing over and over again and expect a different result. Not going to happen. Exactly. Whatever you do, Take whatever you do, stick with it. Yeah. Not going to get a result patient, in three I months. I think patience is the patience problem. Patience is really right? important. Well, you know, but make sure the data supports what you're doing. Like if you're doing, a, if you've got a, a business that where you've hired out an appointment center, you know, and they promise appointments, make sure you're getting them. Make sure they sit after they're booked and that they're, you know, in your in your range, right? Vet, but give it a chance. Hundred percent, Jake. Thanks for coming on. Amen. This session was recorded. We're gonna have it shortly up on MSPinitiative.com for everyone else. Thanks for joining. We'll catch you on the next one. And Jake, hopefully, we'll run out, you know, into each other on the road somewhere. We'll see you out there. Thanks, George. You got Bye. It. See you guys.